That sound? Sound good. Okay, good. Sound is good. Okay, well, good to see you again. I hope that everyone had a good break. Uh, lunch was lovely here, and uh, boy, what a what a feast on God's word you guys have been having. Cami and I are coming right into the middle of it, and I've been tasked uh, this morning. I was tasked with Colossians three one through eleven. Esther, you hit it out of the ballpark with twelve through seventeen. Uh, such a rich passage, and Esther really brought it home, and I, t- I took some good notes there. So thank you, sister, uh, for feeding my soul. Uh, I am tasked with 318 to 21. Uh, let me, I'll tell you a quick story about uh, this passage. Uh, uh, this has to do with wives and husbands and children, and there's a word used here that is seen in our Western culture as a nasty word, and that's submission. Uh, When Cammie and I were married, Cammie uh, married me as someone who has been praying for my family, my biological family, uh, since 1984, and I'm still praying for them. I'm the youngest of three sons. I am still the only believer in my family. I think we see my parents getting close, maybe, maybe. Um, And uh, I grew up in New Jersey. And when you grow up in New Jersey, outside New York City, you kind of absorb whatever New Yorkers believe. And one of the, the staples of New York society is much of Western culture is the, the basic assumptions of feminism. So when uh, my parents came to our wedding, we had Ephesians 5 read, which is a passage very similar to this passage, which has instructions for wives to submit to husbands and as soon as the wedding was over, she, my mother let me know in no uncertain terms how offended she was that that was read at a wedding. I said, well, it is the word of God um, as far as I'm concerned. But I, wa- I tried my best to unpack that a little bit for her because this is th- a passage like the one we're about to read is a stumbling block for many, many, uh, not just unbelievers, but for believers in our post-feminist culture and so what I think it's important is to bring some nuance into terms of how we think about these verses and how we think about family systems uh, as we go forward. So in order to do that, uh, this morning I noted the importance of context. Context is so important. So I'm going to dig back into a little of Esther's territory, starting with 316, uh, which was actually, Esther, one of the first verses I memorized when I became a Christian, probably in the top 15. Um, And let's go from there. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Okay, so focusing back in on verses 18, 19, 20, and 21, uh, because I'm a New Testament scholar, I can't help but bring little bits and pieces of New Testament scholarship to the table. Um, These are called house rules, and if you were in Paul's time, and you were not a Christian, you were just kind of a Gentile or a Jew and wandering down the street, and you picked up, I found a copy of Colossians on the ground, and picked it up and read it, and you you read these four verses, you said, oh, I've heard that before, or something like that, because in Greek society and in in Jewish society, uh, there were certain established standards of familial life, and these were sometimes written down. As kind, of, as kind of like the basic pillars of a well-functioning society. So on a basic level, these what are sometimes called house codes or house rules are a way of signaling to our culture that, well, whatever you think is the stabilizing factor on an outward society in terms of conjugal relations and father-to-parent relations, we're with you in principle, or at least on some level. But what Paul does that's very different is he takes some of these moralizing standards and he gives them a theological basis and a theological rooting. And it's absolutely critical 
in our marriages and in our family life that we keep that context intact. Because if you take Paul's instructions like command, as, as commands abstracted from the theological context, as just like, here's the family rules, don't ask any more questions, that's going to go poorly. And that will backfire, and that's not at all what Paul has in mind when he's get issuing these commands, when he's issuing these imperatives. He wants to make sure in everything that we do as we, as we follow Christ, we think theologically and we think deeply about what we're doing. And again, this begins in, in Colossians 3.16. Um, so I want to go over that passage a little bit. And the way I, wa- the way I want to put this is in o- th- when you look at th- these verses and you, you ask, like, you know, what are we exactly asking wives to do? We're asking them to submit to husbands and maybe, maybe, I don't know, you have to ask Kimmy, so there's some days that's easy, but there's a lot of days that's really hard because I make it hard because, because of my sinful tendencies. And there's a lot of wives out there for who that is, for whom that is hard every day. And maybe I do wonder why this order, why in a patriarchal society in first century Judaism was nothing if it wasn't patriarchal, why are wives lifted first, then husbands, then children? You might expect another order where it goes husbands, wives, children, and maybe one possible theory is why Paul starts with the wives is because he wants to start on the expert ski slope and then work his way down because uh, this is hard business. Uh, it's hard business for everybody. It's hard business. Uh, marriage is hard business. Uh, fam- running a unified family is a hard business, especially when there's pressures on the outside society. Mere commands aren't going to do it. You need the theological rooting, and you need that kind of basis. Paul, I think, provides that starting in verse 16, and I call that lump of teaching the right posture. Let's put it this way. Uh, so yesterday I told you I was, I was visiting with some people from the University of Florida. Now, for those of you who are not from around Gainesville, I know that's a number of you, um, the University of Florida is a big deal. And it's right here in town. And the big deal at the University of Florida is a place called the Swamp. Now, maybe I get Chipper up here to talk about the Swamp, but it's, it's the football arena where it all happens, right? Uh, this long legacy of football. So um, Bill Kynes and I... Uh, Bill played here at UF maybe about 50 years ago, played quarterback. And I said, let's go get a tour together. So we got, some, um, we, we got somebody to open it up for us and um, got a tour of the stadium. And uh, th- this, is, this is where heroes are made uh, for, for Gatorland. Is that right, Chipper? Am I on track? Okay, he's, he's, go- he's giving me the thumbs up. Uh, you, you know, what, what Bill remarked to me, he said when he played, the linebackers were like, 200 pounds in those days. And now, you, if you put 200 pounds and you play it, you get killed. I mean, it's just like the bigger, faster game, and you would never walk into a game without padding. That would be a suicide mission. I think if you try to keep the edicts of 318, 19, 20, and 21 without the spiritual padding, it's like walking to a football game, or, you know, without, without the... the Theological context, like walking a football game without pa- padding, you're going to get pounded, and you're going to be out of the game really early. And so we go back to this right posture, and there's three pieces to it. The first is you need the right spiritual dynamic, uh, the right spiritual dynamic. And, and that really starts at verse 16, where Paul says this, and Esther did such a great job with this, when she, said, when she talked about how Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I just want to camp out on that just, just for a minute because this, to me, is a preamble. You've got a series of imperatives in this whole discourse going all the way back to 312. Paul has about five or six imperatives, and if when you do Bible study, it's always sometimes a good idea to get out a pencil and say, you know, here's an imperative, here's an imperative. And if you happen to have Greek, and I encourage uh, lay people to get Greek, too. If you happen to have Greek, you, can, you know what a true imperative is as opposed to a participle. I digress, but it's one great way to do Bible study because it helps you figure out what's going on in the passage. Paul's giving a string of imperatives. Let the word of, uh, of Christ dwell in you, is richly in you, is a kind of imperative that sets the stage for what he's about to say. In other words, the first thing we need to do to put our padding on is we need a vibrant walk with the Lord. 
where the word of God is feeding our soul day by day. And I love the image of let the word of God dwell in you richly. And it it suggests to me a a story I have, and maybe it just came to mind because our flight suddenly got canceled and we're trying to figure out, you know, how to get out of town tonight. Um, Where I was stuck in Orlando because the flight was delayed like seven or eight hours. And I was with my friend, and when we were at the the gate, they said, well, to make up for it, we're going to give you these vouchers or food coupons, and they're worth like $40, but they expire today. And so, you know, what do you do when you, and they're good anywhere in the airport, so you just say, okay, so how am I going to spend all this money, you know, in this short time? I'm not going to buy a bunch of carrots and take them home on the plane. It's something we're going to eat now. And it's almost like having room service in the airport, right? So you just you, you kind of plan it out. So for those eight hours, it was a real hassle being delayed that long. But we dwelled rich, richly at the terminal. Or imagine you're in a five-star hotel, and someone puts you up in the hotel and says, you know, I've opened up a tab for you. We're asking you to spend $500 on yourself. Of room service, order whatever you want. It's on us. And you say, thank you. What if we treated the word of God that way in our lives, where we say, word of God, you, I want, I'm inviting you to dwell in us richly, uh, we'll open up a room service tab, have as much of my attention, whatever you need, I'm giving it to you. Sometimes when it comes with, uh, to our time with God, we give God the crumbs. Uh, we let the word of God dwell or maybe stay uh, in us uh, with, in poverty. Uh, and th- what, if, what if our life looked like a life where the word of God just like was on the fifth floor of our five-star hotel, and, and whatever the Word of God wanted from us, we said, Word of God, you're dwelling in me richly. I'm giving you first priority. Um, and then that's, that's just the way it's going to go. If that's your reality, if, if you have that right dynamic, that right spiritual dynamic, that's going to position you for success in your family life. Because the man or woman who is, and the ch- or the child who's fed daily on the Word of God has a kind of sustaining power that the Spirit uses. Uh, in my theology, w- when it comes to the Spirit, the Spirit is ultimately our strength. The Spirit is the source of our joy, but the Spirit also normally likes to come alongside the Word of God and speaks to us through the Word of God, and if we're spending time out, or we're forgetting about spending time in the Word, somehow we begin to leak the Holy Spirit. So that's the first step, is... Being, uh, letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The result of that is the right spiritual dynamic. Uh, the, the next step is the right attitude. And I, w- I want to draw your attention to s- something that's going on in verse 15, 16, 17. Uh, in 15, he says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, because you were called to one body. And one more thing, you Colossians, be thankful. And then, he, and then Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, singing psalms and hymns with spiritual songs, with thanksgiving in your hearts. And then verse 17, finally, whatever you do, give thanks to God. Did you notice that between 15, 16, and 17, thanksgiving is exhorted three times? It's almost as if Paul is obsessed with thanksgiving. It's almost as if he's saying, if you want to try to live the Christian life without an attitude of thanksgiving, good luck with that, because it's just really hard. So remember, we're putting our padding on for the big game. Uh, and if, if letting the word of Christ dwell in richly is one pad, we need to be equipped with an attitude of thanksgiving. And here's, there's a couple reasons why that's important for parents and for kids. Uh, let's start with the kids. You know, one thing that we, I was uh, that I've noticed about uh, culture at universities and even for twenty somethings, and that we actually we talked about this as a leadership team at Trinity just two days ago, is the uh, is the idea of Thanksgiving, and how for some reason we find so many young people who struggle with Thanksgiving, and I struggle with it, and maybe you struggle with it too. But it, my sense is there's a window there of young people who really, really struggle with Thanksgiving. And I wonder if one of the reasons for that may, it, it maybe has to do with the pandemic, like which is creating anxiety, and it's hard to be anxious in the midst of anxiety. 
Uh, maybe it's causing depression, and it's hard to be, give thanksgiving in the midst of depression, or you have to work harder at it. But there's also, in Western culture, a deep sense of entitlement, where one of the messages we send to our young people over and over and over again is, you are the most important person in the universe. And you hear that enough, you start to believe it. And so when you get to, the, get to college and you get that teacher who doesn't give you what you want, or you get that coach who doesn't play you all the time, or you and fill in the gap yourself, you feel like you're being sinned against and that the universe suddenly isn't getting with the program that you've been told from day one that you're the most important person in the world. And uh, what happens is if when we give our young people this unabated sense of entitlement, it ultimately militates against the, the very possibility of their having, a, their having Thanksgiving in their hearts. Because they say, well, that, I deserve that anyway. That should be mine anyway. This is mine. I don't need to give you thanks for this because this is all mine by right. And what's, what's happened at the end of postmodernity in Western society is we promise with the Declaration of Independence that um, every man is given the, the right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what the Founding Fathers meant by happiness is not what me, we mean by happiness today. Happiness today means everything, even my sexuality, even all my choices, on my terms. So anything I want, I should have by right. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked in all that, but, but what that does is that creates a kind of set of expectations, again, in which Thanksgiving feels very out of place. For us, and, uh, Thanksgiving is really important, um, and as, as in for us adults and for husbands relating to wives, and wives relating to husbands, Thanksgiving is important because, you know, m as I said, and as you know who are married, marriage is hard, and it's easy to start picking on your spouse. It's easy to find little faults, especially, especially when you feel like your cup is always uh, less than half full. And if you bring your cup before God and you feel like God is doing a shabby gut job of treating you and filling your cup and you're always feeling empty, you're going to take that emptiness to your spouse and you're not going to say this, this might not even be conscious, but sh there's a part of you that's going to say, your job is to fill my cup. And that's an impossible task because only God can fill your cup. And sometimes we enter our marriages and put such heavy expectations on our spouses and we say, your job is to meet all my needs so that I feel fulfilled, I feel whole, I feel like fully human, I'm you know, the perfect woman, I'm the perfect man, and your job is to make me feel that way. And the problem, friends, is when you ask that of your spouse, you might as well ask them to jump the Grand Canyon. Because only God can do that. And when you have meeting times with God or when you have a spirit of thanksgiving uh, with God, you're recognizing all the wonderful gifts that God has. Yes, trials, but you also learn to see the silver linings in the trials and the way that God is using your suffering and your trials to build into you. And, and that just changes the whole, your whole orientation on life. And imagine the difference that brings into a marriage when you approach your spouse in the gear of thanksgiving it can change everything. And when you bring that attitude toward your children, because, you know, sometimes I catch myself getting really nitpicky in my mind with their children, where I can always find things that they can do better. Of course I can. And you can too. But, but then I stop and say, but there's so many great things that God is doing in my son's life. So many things I'd say, wow, that's amazing. And I should start with that and be giving thanks for that. So the right dynamic, the right attitude, then finally the right motivation. Verse 17, Paul says this, whatever you do, in word or deed, and I guess he could have said thought, but word or deed pretty much covers it. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this actually builds on uh, this morning, because this morning I was taking pains to reflect on how Paul was uh, underscoring the fact that we're dead in Christ. So that once you're dead in Christ, I mean, dead people don't do anything for themselves. But when you're dead in Christ and then risen with Christ, 
you're, you've reached a nodal point where you're not doing anything for yourself anymore. You're not living life for yourself. You're living life for Jesus Christ. So that every word you say, every word that comes out of your mouth, every, every synapse of the brain, every twitch of the muscle is for the furtherance of the kingdom. Amen? And so if that's really the case, if what everything we do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that means our motivation coming into our marriages has to be what's best for the kingdom. What do we do for Jesus' sake in this marriage? Now, the reason why that's so important to note is because that is not how the vast majority of non-Christian marriages work. And I would eventually say that's not probably not the way most Christian marriages work. And the reason I say that is because when I meet married people, uh, I'll, you know, sometimes you talk to them, and or, or I do marriage counseling with people, and I have, before you know it, you, you sometimes get the sense that, okay, the way they're thinking about their marriage is they're coming into this marriage, and they're saying, my spouse's job is to meet my needs. And the reason I came into this marriage was to have my needs met. That's the only reason I'm here. And the man comes in and says, the only reason I married you was to have my needs met. There is no, and that is so unbiblical. God did not set up marriage, yet on some level he did. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 7. So I don't want to absolutize that. But the main point of marriage is to glorify God. And to ask as a couple, what does God want from our marriage? What is God doing with our family? And how do we get there? That's a very, very different set of questions than hey, I've got this wife, I've got these kids, what can they do for me lately? And now we never come out and say that out loud, we never say that on a uh, conscious level, but we will often, and I will often say that on an unconscious level, where I'm sometimes trying to manipulate things in order that my needs are met. Without, and, the re, and what that really means is I'm not obeying Colossians 3.17. I've stopped doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, I'm doing a lot of stuff in the name of Nick, and it's got to stop. So if we've got the right uh, dynamic and the right attitude and the right motivation, maybe, maybe, maybe we're ready to start talking about this other business. And while we're talking about motivations, I mean, the, the reality is you're not very married, married very long before you realize that the things that you want out of your marriage, it doesn't mean that you don't ha have desires and wants, and those are natural, and those are good, and those should be met on some level. Um, but the things that you want out of your marriage is a little bit different what your spouse wants, or maybe very different. And that is because men and women are different. And psychological studies report this, brain science supports this. Um, you know, uh, th there have been days where, you know, I've had a long day at work, and I, and I come home, and Cammie has broken her back, cleaning the house, doing maybe even cut the grass, done this, done that. And I'm just feeling sorry for myself or tired, and I just come home, I put on the TV and just get out my iPhone or whatever, and I start looking at the news. I don't appreciate any things that she's done. I, I barely say hi. And she's like, okay. And, I'm real, and, and for me, it's like I'm just not on her zone where that would have been the perfect moment to, to stop, look around, and say, you clean the house. You cook this dinner. You cut the grass. I'm so appreciative of what you did. And oh, and you cut your hair. And I noticed that. And, and when I fail to do that, uh, it, it means I've really missed, but I'm not geared into the kinds of things that she needs. And of course, men need things too. I mean, men, men need you know, times of validation. There are times where if every guy wants to hear from uh, his wife, you know, you're my hero. Um, you, you did this well, uh, they need respect, and they need, they need forgiveness. Um, and those things are important. So, but imagine again a, a, a marriage where he's, she's coming in because she has her unconscious checklist of all the things that she wants out of the marriage, and he's got his checklist coming in, and those checklists don't line up at all. Where's that going to go? That's, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. And that, char that dynamic characterizes so many marriages. But Paul's saying that's not the Christian model. The Christian model is everything you do is for God. Therefore, your marriage is for and about God. And so whatever activities you have to enter into to reinforce that, 
that's what you need to do. Okay, so now on to uh, verses 18. It starts with wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Now, I think w- before going any further, two quick qualifications on, on this verse. Uh, number one, when you compare this passage with the parallel in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, it's set up different grammatically in Ephesians chapter 5. The first command is actually submit to one another, Paul says. And then he says, wives, submit to your husbands. That's Ephesians. In Colossians, Paul just jumps in with wives, submit to your husbands. Interestingly, he doesn't say submit to one another. But, but what's striking to me about that is I think Paul doesn't even need to say that because I think he assumes it's true. And maybe one of the reasons he assumes it's true is because there's good evidence that Ephesians and Colossians were written within uh, maybe six months of each other, maybe within a year of each other, circulated together in the same part of Asia Minor, probably in the 60s. And so the reader of Ephesians would have also read Colossians and vice versa. So Paul was said, I covered that, but that's Christianity 101. You already know that if you come into the family of God, um, there's no strong hierarchies here in the sense of uh, somebody is always going to be submitting absolutely to this other person or this other class. It's primarily about mutual submission. So my goal as you, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, my goal is to serve you and submit myself to you. Uh, my goal is to submit myself to my wife. Um, that's, that's part of my job. That's job number one as a husband is to be a submissive husband to my wife. Now, she has to submit to me as well, but the, the emphasis first and foremost is on the mutuality of submission. Paul doesn't state it here. I think it's uh, assumed in um, uh, the f- prior four verses. I also think it's stated explicitly in Ephesians, which accompanied Colossians. That's, so that's the first thing. There's a, this is in, embounded in a spirit of mutual submission. Second thing is we know from, a, from Romans 13, which talks about submitting to governing authorities, that this is not absolute submission. And what I mean by that is when wives are called to s- submit to their husbands, it, it doesn't mean that, th- that that submission is unconditional there are certain conditions in which submission no longer makes sense. Namely, uh, when your spouse is asking you to do something that's disobedient to the covenant and, and doesn't stand a pace of what God commands, or if you're in danger of any sort. Because if, if your husband, wives, if your husband puts, you, uh, puts your uh, security or your safety at risk, he's already broken the covenant at that point. And uh, all bets are off in terms of that, that special relationship. The reason why I state this is because uh, in some circles of Christianity, I suspect there are individuals who will take this as a carte blanche for um, really unhealthy marriage relationships and even spousal abuse, and that is not from God. And it should never be used to that from God. On the other hand, uh, when people come back and say, well, verses like these lead to spousal abuse, um, I think you could just, you, you, it's just as easy to make the argument to say, well, just because there's some bod, bad bosses out there in the employment world or the corporate lawyer world, does that mean we should ne- have no longer employers, employees? It can be done. It can be done well. In bad instances, doesn't mean we should get rid of the whole institution. Okay, so wives submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Again, um, the way Kim and I look at our marriage, we're mutually submissive to each other. But I think that Paul's also tapping into something about gender roles and gender identity um, on, on a psychological level. And then there's, I think, a theological piece we need to talk about, too. And that is this, is that, um, yes, wives need to be loved and um, men need to be loved, um, but men really, really need support from their wives. And when I counsel guys o- over the years and talk with guys over the years, I find that the hardest patches in their marriages are when, let's say a guy gets fired from his job, maybe it was something he did, maybe it wasn't exactly, and when his spouse, his wife, you know, he comes home, tells his wife, and she says, oh, I knew that would happen, you know, or or shows lack of support, that can be the the most damaging thing to their marriage. Um, You've heard the phrase, stand by your man. There's kind of a biblical sentiment to that. Um, That's, so men really need that. And I think when it says wives submit to your husbands, um, that gets at the sense of what it means. 
And this is fitting to the Lord. And you say, well, how is this fitting to the Lord? And I think, again, here, I'm going to take us back to the broader context of the New Testament canon, particularly in Ephesians, because Paul makes really clear that his teachings about uh, these things are within the framework of, of deep Christological truth. And that is, as the wife is to the husband, so the church is to Jesus Christ. And this also helps us with the second command in verse 19, where it says, husbands, love your wives. So what I'm getting at here is the asymmetry between the husband's obligation and the wife's obligation. Again, do not hear me saying that men don't need loves and that women don't need submission from their husbands. They do. But in terms of emphasis, Husbands, our job is to love your wives. And what does that mean? Does that mean buying chocolate at Valentine's Day and flowers? And maybe that's a start, yes. But the Bible s makes very clear in defining love. It just comes out and says in 1 John, this is love. Not that uh, we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. So as difficult as it is to, for wives to submit to husbands, I think you have to immediately say, here's the flip on that, is husbands are called to love wives exactly as Christ loved the church. And, how, and you stop and say, okay, well, well, how did Christ love the church? Well, Jesus washed the disciples' feet on the day of his arrest. He was crucified for the church the next day and risen. Jesus gave it all for the church. He loved the church unto death. And so, so men are calling as husbands, for my brothers here who are married, well, for you young guys who are hoping to get married, uh, this is not for the faint of heart. Because your commitment to your wife means that you need to be prepared to go as far as Jesus went in loving the church, and that was crucifixion on a Roman cross. And you might say, well, yeah, I would do that for, I would take a bullet for you, dear. But how, what does that look like at every day? Uh, can, can you carry the cross every day, loving your wives, and he throws in this for no extra charge. Paul says, do not be harsh with them. Or another way to translate the Greek is don't embitter them. And I think what Paul is getting at when he says don't, don't embitter them is it's really the flip side of loving. In my experience, I've, uh, when I run into women who've been married many years and they're loved, it's almost like there's nothing that can really take them down. Because there's a security about this, there's a, a serenity about this. They they they're just they feel like they're in the right place. On the other hand, I've also met women who've gone through long marriages and never really felt loved, and they really struggle with bitterness. And they struggle with bitterness because they their their husband's job was to to be there for them, to give them that love, and what happens is that. When wives don't receive the love that God, God puts on their hearts, over time, bitterness becomes such an overwhelming temptation. And you can't just say it's all their fault. And when you think about that, you realize this is, and this is true for both husbands and wives here, you hold your spouse's destiny in your hand. You have an amazing power, men, to make or break your wives. Amazing power to make them into glorious beauties who know that they're loved or to make them into embittered Miss Havishans. If you're familiar with Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, there's a very interesting character named Miss Havisham who lived in a house by herself in her wedding dress. She was jilted at the altar and never took her wedding dress off. She and she lived for years in that bitterness and then starts uh, in revenge, taking it out on, on one of the main characters in that book. Um, you can make a Miss Havisham out of your wife, men, or you can make a raging beauty internally. And, and wives, you can do the same in the sense of the, the little nuances of what you say and what you do in your attitude can so embolden your husband. And, and, and make them great or can just beat them down day by day so they become less and less conformed to the image of Christ. And when we stand before the Lord, 
it, it, it's awe-inspiring to think that the question that God is going to ask me, because I know from Ephesians that, you know, I'm called husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church, washing her with the water of the word. God's, Jesus is going to say to me, one of his first questions, like, forget about everything else. Let's talk about Cammy, and what did you do for her in order that she conformed to my image, in order that she was washed to the word? And I said, well, I had a lot of football to watch. I, I, I don't know. I had, I had other things to do, and, and I had, had these things going on, Lord, and, and, and he's not going to buy it. But, the, but think of the power, as, as a married person, the power you have uh, in, in your spouse's life. And that's an awesome thing, and it's an awesome responsibility and one you should take seriously. Paul goes on to say, okay, children, it's your turn. And, of course, we are all children here. And uh, many of us in this room have parents. My parents are both still alive. Uh, I mentioned to you my parents are not believers. Um, they still aren't. We have been, I've been praying for them for decades to come to receive Christ. I think they will. Um, and there have been many times as an adult where I had to come back to a verse like this where my p- parents are trying to push us in a direction that isn't the way we wanted to go or felt like this is the way God wants us to go. But I want to also make sure that I'm honoring my parents. And, and so there's sometimes tricky calls in life um, where we have to say, what is God calling us to do? But this is one of the Ten Commandments, obeying your parents, uh, is, a, is a key feature of covenantal living. Um, and we do this because it pleases the Lord. For those of us who have children now, young children, or who um, plan on having children. I think this verse is helpful for us because we know that our children's job is to obey us. And you say, well, I can't really control whether my children obey us. Well, in a way, there is. Because we know that children's obedience pleases the Lord. So the question for us parents is, how do we engineer a household that's going to increase the probability of our children obeying. Not superficially, not by saying, hey, uh, you know, if you obey, I'll give you $20. But really, that's, I mean, Christian obedience, covenantal obedience. What kind of conditions need to be in place? What kind of relationships? What kind of attitudes? What do we do for our children? So when the time comes to say, you need to clean up your room, or, you know, you need to go shopping for that shirt with me, or whatever, right? That, um, and, and we, you know, for those of us who raised kids, and for Cammie and I, it was for both our boys, the day they turned 13, it was like they changed identities into, like, now they're really their own people, and they want to do their own thing, and they think mom and dad are duds, and, and then by the time they're 22, they realize we're, we're pretty cool again. So, um, <laughs> but you go, you go through those phases, and if you, if you lay the groundwork where you have the relationships in place, where you can lead them along in obedience, that's, that just doesn't make their home life easier. More important, that's pleasing God and, and, and creating that situation. Now, what's interesting, we're getting close to wrap-up here, but verse 21, what's interesting to me is it comes back to fathers in verse 21. Do not provoke your children. It's almost like Paul saying, moms, you know what you're doing. Don't worry about it. Got you covered. But fathers, fathers, you got to listen because this is where you can blow it. The, Paul gives fathers no positive commandment here. He assumes there's positive things a father's going to do. But he knows there's a temptation with fathers. He knows there's a temptation to provoke children uh, and to exacerbate children. That's another way of translating it, to just wear them out. And, and, the, and when I think about my own fathering over the years, and I, and I would never consider myself a great father. I had good days. I had bad days. Um, you know, d- days where I just said, okay, I really have to think about this. And sometimes Cameron would kind of pull me into the room and said, well, how about we rethink this approach? And I said, good move, okay. And I, and I needed that. Um, but I also knew that when, you know, when it came to raising my two sons, and maybe it would have been different from daughters, maybe if I had a daughter, you know, I, I'd just be wrapped around her finger or something. But I would have certain standards that I expect them to live by and they'd be high standards because I want great things for them. And it's, you know, the question is, how do you balance that out? And I, somebody told me a story one day of um, a son, a, a 12-year-old son who just really wanted to please his dad. 
and it was Father's Day, so he said, I'm going to cut the cut grass for Dad on Father's Day. And so he was all excited because he never cut grass for dad, his dad before. Got out there with a lawnmower, cut the grass. Father comes home on Father's Day. He looks at the l- yard, and he storms into the house. And he says, what did you do to my lawn? And the mother looks out and says, well, yeah, maybe the lines aren't perfectly straight, but it's decently straight, and it's cut. And, and the father was so angry about it that he, had, that he just went out there, didn't say thank you, and a huff says, I have to recut the grass now because you ruined my lawn. And at that moment, the son's heart was broken because he realized that there's nothing he could do realistically by which he could please his father. And he thought he had just done such a great job. And was it, was it a landscaping professional expertise job? No, but that, that wasn't the point. That's not what he was trying to do. But the father's expectations were such that there's no way any kid could have lived up to it because the father was just in his own little world in terms of what he expected. Paul knows about this dynamic, and so he just calls fathers out in a special way. And fathers do have a special power with their children. Uh, We know from numerous studies that the the probability of kids staying in the church has to do less with the mother choices than the father choices. If the father is involved in church and the father goes and is in and locked in, there's a high, much higher probability that the kids will likewise grow up to be involved in church. If the mother is locked in and the father stays at home watching football, reading the newspaper, the chances the kids making it through church decline dramatically. Uh, what's been unhelpful in, in Western society is starting with the 19th century in, in, with Victorianism, uh, Christianity was framed in such a way that it became a kind of home religion where dad's job, dad's job was to go off to work, to be in industry or at the office. He'd bring home the bacon, work nine to five. Mom's job was to be at home and do the religion thing. And mom became the central priest of the home. And, got, and the father's role was vague at best. And, and that model has done serious, serious damage on all kinds of levels in Western society and has actually increased the fe- what I, I see as a feminization of the gospel in Western societies, um, where many, many men, men are uninterested in the gospel because they see it as, as, as just a kind of aspect of being feminine. And that, goes, that has its roots in the 19th century. Uh, Paul says, look, fathers, this command is for you because, again, this was patriarchal society, but fathers were essentially the priests of the, of the family. And in, in, in first century Jewish world, the, the father led the liturgies, said the Sabbath prayers, and, and I just take for granted that that was actually the biblical order. Um, I'm complementarian. Maybe uh, many people other here are not, y- and you disagree with me on this. But I think there's some, there is something about the father's role that where the father has to have some kind of uh, special. The parents are both priestly figures in the household for sure. But the father has to be in the game and has, has to be on the lead and has a certain power with the children that the mother does not. So that means, fathers, you really have to attend to that priestly role. You have to take it seriously. Um, What's the final note I have here that's really interesting is that it does seem that the father-children relationship, or, you know, children, they have to obey both the parents. Fathers get a special call out in verse 31. But the marital relationship comes first. And the reason why I think it comes first is because in the household uh, ecosystem, the marriage is more important than the whole family as a whole. And the reason why I take pains to say this is because in our helicopter parenting society, I find run into way too many parents where you can quickly discover that for a given spouse, the kids are more important than the, than the husband. And there's more attention on the kids, and the husband's just out there, or vice versa, where the father is so you know, tied up with the kids and the wife's an afterthought, and it becomes a child-centered home. And, um, I mean, what you want is a Christ-centered home. But if there's a hierarchy at all, it begins with God and then moves to marriage and then moves to the kids. And when we invert that, um, that doesn't do the children any favors because they start to feel the instability of that. And they don't want that much control, and they don't want that much power. Uh, I, I believe what kids want more than anything else is to know that things are cool with mom and dad, and that coolness ultimately comes from God.
They might, they might not always say things consistent with that, but I think in their heart of hearts, that's what they're after. So those are my comments. Cammie, do you want to come up here? I think we're, uh, uh, how do you want to do this? Have you, you want to? Okay. And then we will invite you and Sam. Okay, good. Uh, sorry about that, Sam. Uh, so, and then we will, uh, we will ask uh, you know, our people to ask questions. Great, okay.